Hello, and welcome to the video version of the Left of Greg podcast. I'm Brian Marin, the host and creator of the show. As always, I will be joined by human behavior expert, Mr. Greg Williams, who the show is affectionately named after. On the show, we discuss different topics through the lenses of what we call human behavior pattern recognition and analysis. If you'd like to find out more about what that is, please check the links in the episode details and go to our website to learn more. Please don't forget to follow us on social media. The links are also in the episode details and hit the like and subscribe button to help support our work. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoy the show. I wish okay, you would have got that last comment. Yeah, your last Ryan, comment, your been... intro comments, I always wait to hit record on until you get whatever whatever uh, thing. Just get it out of my mouth. system. Yeah, that, that, that the listeners don't need to hear. So t- today's, uh, today's topic is... Um, uh, we haven't really kind of done one like this before, uh, but we're talking about what you kind of write up as the top 10 rules of, of human behavior. Yeah. And we've had stuff like this on the website and we use all of these different sayings or terms in, in classes that we teach and throughout the podcast, we always have. So today, I guess we'll kind of define it for everyone, what we mean. And, you know, a couple things from our one, these, these top 10 lists, I always hate, you know, it's always clickbait when you see oh the 10 things you need to know and it's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, not it's what just, this is this and not the funny thing is too is the funny thing is too is that that there's 10 they're in no distinct order they just happen to be like recipes that we've always used you okay. know what i'm saying and, and that's a good way to look at it these are uh 10 ingredients you need to have in your kitchen there you go so, so whether you're if, making, if you don't have these in your pantry yeah, right yeah. You, you're you're you need these things to make Great. bread to make uh cupcakes to you know make whatever you know a, a sauce you know what i mean you but you not without fucking these 10 things, things yeah. right? <laughs> you know it's like not having salt and pepper in your house those are the yeah, two right, things right, you right, absolutely right. need to have right exactly um so so i would kind of approach it from from that and again like Good. you said there are no particular order and we'll just go ahead and jump into them and we like i said we post some of this on the website before uh, uh, we've talked about all these things, but they're all uh, very important. And so we're speaking almost at a 30,000 foot view. We're speaking generalization. So when we're talking about human behavior and we're speaking in generalizations, that's what we are, right? So you have to then apply it to a specific context. So we keep things general, right? When you talk, when you're, you, when you're generalizing, you have to keep things general. So, so that, that's fine. That, that, that's kind of what we're doing, right? With this, but I'll go ahead and just start off. And, and again, no particular order, but, but right off the top of the list that I have here is you have attention. Humans won't pay attention unless they have to. So first, Amen. I would ask you to kind of define what you mean by attention and then what you mean by they won't pay attention unless they have to. Okay. So the entire back of your head is your visual field. From your ear to your ear, the entire back of your head, which means vision is important. Your nose is above your mouth which means a sense of smell, olfactory senses are hugely important. Uh, Your arms reach out away from your body, which means that they don't want things to touch you before you're aware of them. Those are things that your brain has to attend to with your limbic system, with uh, 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 all of the different uh, senses, the onboard uh, uh, ability to sense make your environment. So you can't problem solve without sense making and attention is the critical element of that. And people won't uh, pay attention unless they're forced to, which means that even though it's the best thing for you and all you have to do is uh, come off the gas and look around you. You you heard the old stop and smell the roses. Do you get what Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that once in a while, what happens is uh, uh, your brain uh, ceases to be amazed by sensory input around it that's novel or that's dangerous. So, so you'll miss these big honking cues. I, I give you a, just an example. You know that it, it was just Christmas. And so being in a store for Christmas, seeing a, a complete uh, 96 that might, uh, a person that is predisposed to cause trouble in an environment. Okay. So you would call it a disorderly bordering on. Or whatever. emotionally disturbed what person kind of or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's and, different and, terms. And it right? doesn't matter what their, their motivation is. And, and I don't want to get into that. So you're exactly right. It could be emotionally disturbed. It could be just the person's at the, uh, uh, their cup is full and they're coming out and one more fruitcake is going to put them over the edge and it's going to be stabby time. So this person is standing there and I looked at Shell and Shell's a million miles away because she's going down this mental list of what we're about to do. And I look at her, I go at my six and she immediately snapped out of where she was and orients towards the threat. And I go, you know what? I'm blessed because I have a human with me that can do that. Do you know how many other humans would have, first of all, missed all those signals, right? And then 
Brian trying to call somebody else on a potential threat to get them oriented mentally? Okay, what would they have done? What? Aware? Who, who are you talking? Well, now the, the whole moment's blown with fluff. You, you see, survival instincts are, are based on nanoseconds. And, and so if you're not in the moment predicting this may be a danger, and, and humans won't. Now, now what's going to happen? Pop, pop, pop. And the next thing that they're going to say is, oh, I thought that there were balloons going off in the mall. Do you get how that, that time right. lag and, creates an extra loop, Brian, that does not have to be and there? So, so when you say they won't pay attention unless they have to, so yep. we're now at a point um, kind of in, in human species where we're at and societally where um, there's not a lot that we have because it's based in survival yep. is what you're saying. Uh, we won't pay attention. Now the things that we won't, we, we, we pay attention to are so small because there's so much competing for our attention in our environment. Precisely. Right? So, yeah. so there's a flashing sign, there's your phone, there's the kids screaming, there's the voice over the intercom at the store you're at. There's, uh, uh you know, billions spent on marketing and advertising to put the right thing at the right eye level to catch yep. that attention for you to spend money. I mean, remember this is all about, it's about spending money for the most part that we're right. around. And so, you know, that's what we're now attending to in our environment. So we're not attending to other humans in our environment. Exactly. We're not attending to the overall situation and potential for danger because we haven't had to attend to those for things so long. for so long. So, so let me throw one at you, Brian. Uh, uh, I've got a lot on my mind. I'm getting older. I am, want to forget things that I shouldn't be forgetting. And so uh, I had a lot going on with all the snow mitigation. I sent you some of the photos yeah, and the videos geez, of the snow. Uh, yeah. uh, feel free to, to post one of those if the, the, the viewers and listeners don't believe it. Um, but uh, uh, went out of the, the front of the house, the entire Rogue Manor West. Uh, sorry for Demo Dick. Oh, Marzenko. yeah. Shout out God to Demo Dick, your buddy. And, and, and uh, so uh, walking down the stairs, Brian, uh, to, to warm up the, the death sled and to go around and grab some wood for the fire. Got all these th things going on. And for the first time in my life, the first time in 60 years, I locked myself out of the house. Oh, man. Okay? Well, Rogue Manor West is impenetrable, just so you know. <laughs> Second thing is, it's zero. It wasn't below zero. It wasn't above zero. It's zero degrees. There's no such thing as wind chill unless you had, and check it, folks, it's a matter of record. We had gusts up to 55 miles an hour outside. So you've got snow. You've got cold. You've got me wearing a T-shirt running outside to turn on my truck. So now, thank God, I've got my cell phone in my back pocket. So I made one call. A friend of mine came over that's got the, you know, the code to the garage, uh, opened up the, the garage for me and let me in. Brian, I was outside probably about 40 minutes, and it was almost a death sentence. Yeah. I, I walked around. I had all these emergency plans, places I could stand, what kind of, but, but no extra set of keys outside. I'm, I'm not that guy. So I went around to the back deck where the barbecue is, but the barbecue grill, the propane was frozen. So I couldn't turn on the propane oh, to have geez. that source of heat, even though that was my emergency plan. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So, so there were, you know, burn barrels. Well, you got to have all the you know, elements to go in a burn barrel to start that. So I was unprepared and I didn't have to pay attention until I had to. Now that's too late in the game. I'll give you another example. Very brief one. Okay, Brian, on the phone, what's your mom's phone number? Well, for most people, you know what it is? Mom. Yeah. And if you ask them what the numbers were that it correspond to, they would have no idea. So what I'm telling you is unless you're in the trick bag, you look at life differently because we've had it easy for so long. And, and those things, Brian, how many times when we're driving, we're constantly on the ball and, and we gauge where the vehicle is at the intersection with the stop sign. So we always have a way out. And what are we doing when we look around? People putting on their makeup, yep. people texting on, the on their phone. Yeah. So, so attention is such an easy thing to master right right and and we've lost the fine art of paying attention okay um that's a that's a, that's a good explanation i think there i want to kind of keep keep moving but uh um yeah so that's uh, attention obviously is extremely important I, I would put that probably first in all of these but but i know they're not in any particular order so the next one is um predictability and your statement yeah. is humans are predictable okay well, why are we so predictable? Yeah. So one, don't mistake predictability with habit. Habit's a completely different, different thing we'll thing. talk about later. Yeah. Okay. So predictability is that once you've done a path through the woods, it's much less calorie intensive for you to follow that path. Now, if we add something 
that there was an orange or a banana or a, a deer at the end of that path, then our electrochemical neurotransmitters in our brain etch that and say, point A to point B this way, I didn't have to wade through a bog or climb through the trees. And there was a prize at the end of it, a, a male it. or a female or a, a dog I could pet, whatever the hell it was, Brian. And so each time I have now a choice coming out of the cave, primordial ooze, right? Mm -hmm. I'm coming out each time I have a choice. And my choice is 360 degrees in a circle. But I remember that if I went towards the cedar tree and took a left, I got to the hot spring. Do you, do you understand? So, so what happens is that, that, that uh, reward circuitry in the brain activate. And now I'm getting the, the dopamine fix saying this one was the easiest path. Well, now what happens, Brian? Let's, let's fast forward to where we are now. You find a way to get to work. Yeah. And guess what? After that first day that you found a way, do you go out and try to conduct tests? Do you call Mythbusters and, and figure out the mileage and the fuel consumption? No, you repeat that behavior over and over. So humans are predictable. And if I saw you at the Starbucks yesterday at 10 o'clock in the morning and I want to kill you, I have a really good chance if I'm there at 9.59 to see you walking up and I can put two in your caboose. So uh, that's all I'm saying. I'm saying that, that my estimation and my scientific answer would be that humans are very predictable. Okay. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, this gets into you, people have different theories on how this stuff works. And especially like you can go as, um, um, you know, as small or as micro as, you know, someone across from the table, you or the same room as you. And then like, you know, you'll have economists at scale, try to yeah. make predictions about how humans are predictable. And, and, and you can, in those areas, like it, within a defined context, um, you people, and I want, we just want to bring this up real quick. Cause you say humans are predictable. People talk a lot about free will and humans can do anything right. and they can, well, they can make a choice to do this, which is technically true. You can, but no one ever does. Meaning it's unreasonable it, it, to assume that they're going there, to, there's a finite set of responses that you have. There's a finite set of choices you have. There's a finite set of things you're going to do throughout your day. And they're going to be based on predicated on basic survival uh, systems. And like you said, the different habits that we'll get into, you know, later, yeah, yeah. but uh, of what you're likely going to do throughout the day. Exactly. So there's only so many things. So the idea is where, well, this could happen in any place or they could do anything. Well, no, they, they, I mean, you, they they're not going to it's it's right. unlikely everyone you know you, you know you you do something with a purpose you don't just get up and drive around most of the time right you, exactly. you go to the store or you go to the gym or you go pick up your kid from school right so there's only it, it goes into um humans are a lot more predictable than than we kind of think and we give them credit for it. and i would say this brian i would say imagine conduct your own limited objective experiment imagine your route to the safeway or to the 7-eleven or whatever's in your community Okay. The thing that your brain immediately goes to is your mental map of your environment. Mm -hmm. So if I was trying to predict where you would go, what streets you would take, what turns you would make, I would likely be right if I just looked at you and looked for the lowest calorie intervention. This is the safest route, or this is the fastest route. That's where I'm going to put my money uh, to surveil you or to follow you or do something else. Where, and again, we're going to talk about habit. Habit is different. Habit is you repeating behavior uh, uh, over and over because of the memory and emotion links associated with predictability. With like, like, for example, uh, uh, it's predictable which door you'll take when you walk into the Walmart, no matter which one is marked in and out. And the Walmart's different than most stores that you go to because of the way that their cashiers are set up. They have all the cashiers set up in one area. Mm -hmm. So the exit is right in front of the cashiers and they don't want loss prevention. So they limit the size of the exit, right? So the entrances are huge. You get what I'm trying to say? But there's only a sense of, well, what's predictable? If I'm going to steal an item from the store shelf, could you predict where I'm likely to exit the store? Yes. So humans uh, uh, even in the moment, even if they've never done it before, Brian will be predictable. That's the, the big separator there. Okay. So the next one kind of goes into what, what you're talking about is intent. And, you know, you make the statement that the harder humans try to mask or hide their true behaviors, the right. more those behavioral traits will stick out. And, and when we talk about intent, that's what we focus 
all, everything on, right? What is someone's intent? What are they likely going to do? Not what do they think? What do they believe? What do they feel? What their motive or motivation yep. is? Like w- what their ideology is, right? We get into intent. What does this person intend to do? So, so explain what you mean by, by intent. Yeah. So, so remember, intent doesn't have to be a bad thing. The right. intent is the goal at, at the end of whatever, you know, the, the problem solved. So I, I, I'll give you one from my own family, because that's where all my, my best examples come from. So I love my brother, Jeff, dearly. And if you go over to Jeff's house, what you'll notice is that there's a change during the months of the year. If I go over and I see pictures of Uncle Harry and Uncle Harry's grandkids and the nephews and all that other stuff, I know Harry's coming for a visit. Why? Because my brother, Jeff, doesn't want any strife. So his intent is always to make the people coming to visit him in Colorado feel welcome. And so he'll put those things out. Okay. Now that's intentional. He does it for a reason. And the reason is he doesn't want to be off putting. Okay. So intent and intentional. Hey, that's an easy standard to go Mm -hmm. for. So if a person intends to steal a 12 pack of uh, rolling rock from their local seven 11, right. You're bringing there's, back to high school, but go I, ahead. I, mean, I am. <laughs> yeah. There's the old, there's the old hit and run where you come screeching up like Dukes of Hazard. You run in the front door screaming. You grab it and then you try to bail out the same way. Well, that's going to draw the attention of everybody. Even the, you know, old homeless Pete sitting at the front is going to look up and pay attention. If your intent is to get by and steal, you know, be nefarious, then what's going to happen is you're going to walk differently and stand differently and conduct a little counter surveillance and you're going to take the item and lay your hands on it once and, you know, maybe move it, shift it a little bit, but then go over and check out the price on the Funyuns. Brian, all of those, each one of those little behavior traits demonstrates intent. I'm preparing to do something. I'm setting up for the big caper that's coming. And guess what? The more you do that, the more your brain's chemistry goes, oh, I get it. We're trying to be stealthy. And so now you're doing the, the tiptoe. Do you get what I'm trying well, to say? Yeah. You're putting and, and on the glasses, right? And, and so explain that part, what you mean when you say the harder humans try to mask or hide yep. their true behaviors, the yep. more they will stick out. Like what no, you, you Your brain is ahead of you. So, so your, your brain is always trying to go, oh, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to get here before you go there. And so your brain is going to start doing things like, like for example, uh, you're preparing to run. So you're going to start puffing up your chest. Well, guess what? I'm preparing to fight. I'm going to ball up my fist. Uh, yeah, shoulders I'm, will come you, up. You know what start I'm trying to say? You more, don't notice you're doing wait, that. Yeah, nose will you know? open up more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and the histamines, you know, the, uh, you've got histamines that are on board. Uh, uh, histamines read, like, like for example, histamines are, are meant to read, hey, there's an infection. So let's ball up and create a wall of defenses against them. Uh, uh, hey, hey uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's uh, got a cold or he's got the flu. So let's do this. And well, guess what? Your autonomic system is running all the time. So even though you're thinking in the moment right now, your brain starts forecasting what's likely going to happen. And it's good if you're in a firefight. Uh, uh, the brain starts pulling the, the, the oxygenated uh, uh, blood away from the skin because it might need it somewhere else. So all of these, you know, your, your, your vision, uh, uh, my, my peripheral vision is less important in a survival situation. So I'll be more focused, Brian, and, and that mission focus will stand out. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, that, that covers intent pretty well. And I know we go into that a lot because it's, it's far more important to understand what someone's likely to do and what, what they're, you know, I would rather focus yep. on what someone's intent is not what any, any of the Their other junk, all the, yeah, all yeah, the right. pundits that are on there that, that really doesn't matter because that well, group, that group didn't exist five years ago. So, but that person still did, and they're still doing the same thing. So maybe that's Can not I throw what one it's about. More? Yeah, please. On that? Okay. So the recent shooting in Michigan, uh, so yeah. some, some journalist, uh, I don't know if I do the air quotes on journalists anymore. Some journalists wrote a thing that said, Hey, uh, 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 the kid, the shooter, uh, lost, uh, uh, his dog, his dog died, uh, the week before the shooting and, and nine days before the shooting, his best friend moved out of the neighborhood. And three days before the shooting, he brought a dead baby bird in a jar to school or whatever. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sense of a situation where there's no logic and no sense. Okay. Listen. You lost your dog. You had your best friend move yeah. away, and you didn't yeah. become a school shooter. Yeah. Do you understand? So the intent it, is the basis of it. He intended to kill his schoolmates. He intended everything that he did. And so don't try to reach in and go, oh, you know what? 
uh, his Campbell soup spelled out fuck uh, yeah. uh, this morning. <laughs> you, you see what I'm trying to say, though? Yeah. How people just fish and fish and fish for something. That's not scientific. Scientific is take a look at the behavior pattern. What does the behavior pattern tell you that's likely? And if it's more likely they're going to do A than B, then guess what? That's predictive analysis. So prediction and, and intent are very closely very, Yeah, very closely you know? related. Okay, got it. Okay, so the next one is just divided attention. Your brain yeah. hates divided attention. So we talked at first about attention, and then we started getting into it a little bit, but what do you mean by your brain hates divided attention? So your brain has got a, a, a schism with reality anytime it has too much information because it's already made a decision. Before you think, I need to make a decision, your brain's already chosen. So the idea is that you could be in conflict. You could have turbulence anytime that you have more than one option when your brain is already going, yeah, I'm past that. I got it. I, I'll take it from here. And I'll give you a perfect example, driving. Have you ever been driving and you've driven the route many times before? And all of a sudden you look up and go, oh, there's my exit. And the entire time before you go, oh my gosh, I don't remember anything from this point to this yep. point. Why? Because your brain says, hey, I got it. I'll take it from here. It's the same thing when you say, how is it I can take four hours in a doctor's office, but I can't stand for two minutes in a line at the pharmacy? Well, your brain knows that it's going to be in that situation. So your brain shuts off the external focus and just goes, okay, I'm going to be down and in. I'm going to be a tree sloth and look at this gosh damn High Life magazine right. until the doctor calls my name. So when your brain has too much information coming in, okay, it gets to the point where it starts saying, listen, I, well, I'll give you a perfect example. If you look at a, a, a carpet and drapes that don't match, okay, your brain is constantly trying to make order out of chaos. So that is another schism. You're looking at that going, oh, it should be, oh, why the color? Oh, but, uh, and you're exhausted. Five minutes into it, you're exhausted. Why? Because your brain's working overtime trying to solve math problems you don't even see. So if right. you are single-minded of purpose, You'll likely, uh, uh, you only have a hundred percent of attention, right? You'll right. likely do good. And it, it's almost like, uh, you know, I think multitasking would be another good example. Yeah. Like you, you, yeah. you, meaning you, your brain likes to do one thing at a time and focus on one thing, right? Or, or yeah. just a few things. It can't handle a whole lot at once. And so if you get too much at once, it'll, it's going to start kicking something out and, or it's yep. going to start letting something go. Of course, we know that in basic performance, human performance in like Certainly. stressful situations and boring situations, right? There's a lot less that you can do because your brain can only focus on so much, but the divided attention really comes into, uh, you, you know, it's like they take a group of people and they say, all right, who here is really good at multitasking? And half the class raises their hand, they put right. them in that group and they go, who sucks at it? The other one else is like, yeah, I suck at it. And they put them through a bunch of multitasking, you know, tests. And it turns out the people who said that they suck at multitasking actually do way better at them because right. why? Because they, they actually end up only focusing on one thing at a time where the people are like, oh, I can do seven things at once. Well, no, you can't. Uh, yep. And because, because your brain doesn't like the divided attention, it's exactly. a single point of focus. So, so your brain has, uh, 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 gosh, I, I want to say echolocation just to put it in people's mind. I want you to think of echolocation, but it's not exactly the same. When you're walking on a street and there's other people that are walking on the same street, the direction you turn to avoid them, your internal avoidance system for collision, your dis and early warning system is operational all the time. Now, what do we know that screws it up? Drugs and alcohol. Okay. So what else screws it up? Cell phone. Why? Because your cell phone steals a significant amount of your attention. And now when you're walking down the street, what are you constantly doing? You're bumping into people. Sorry. Stepping in front of a car. Eh. OK, all of those things happen because your onboard system says I can deal with this many people at a time. But now you've exceeded my capacity because you demand that I look at something else. Brian, if I'm a, a hunter and, and there's hunters in the audience and it's just, you know, ending most hunting seasons right now, uh, a hunter will say, you know what, I'm sitting in my tree stand and all of a sudden I look over to my left and here's this deer and it came out of nowhere. Well, the deer didn't come out of nowhere. What happened is you exceeded the amount of information right. that you can pay attention to. And so now the deer slowly walked in. And because it didn't ask for more attention, humans won't pay attention unless they have to. What happened is all of a sudden you looked and you went, yeah, it's a deer. We do that in our environment all the time. Yeah. All the time. You How know? many times where's, you hear Hey, where's my glasses? Oh, they're yeah. on top of your head. Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I can't find my phone. You're holding it yep. in your hand. You know what I mean? Yep. You know, ooh, uh, the, that stuff, it, it, it happens all the time. Like you said, those, those slow, subtle changes because it doesn't require my attention or doesn't immediately grasp my attention. Yep. I miss that stuff. So... 
All right. Well, the, the next one is, you know, you kind of defined intent. The next one you talk about is right. telegraphing intent. You say all humans telegraph their intentions unknowingly. What do you, yep. what do you mean by that? So, so everybody right now is going to go, Hey, wait a minute. So this ice cube trade, there's kind of spilling into the mm -hmm. other ones. Yeah, of course they are yep. because we're humans and every one of our systems is intertwined with other systems. So there are no seams and gaps and there's humans no separate, have no seams and gaps. There's no separate and distinct. Nope. This falls into this bucket. This falls nope. into this bucket. And, and you gave the ice cube trade analogy. So I want everyone to think if you're listening, you know, what a lot of education and training tries to do, or, or, or anytime we try to any descriptive analytics, or we're trying to yep. um, uh, codify something. We like these nice little, nice little, you know, ice cube trays where this fits in here, this fits in here. Yep. So we take that ice cube tray, we just we fill it with water. We don't, we, we we the ice is melted, and so if you lean one way, oh, well, every all the all the, the the buckets start to fill up, and the other ones get smaller, and then you lean the other way, and then and they can flow back and forth. So think about yep. just a, a literally an ice cube tray full of water that hasn't been frozen, because that's how all of these buckets are. They go in each each little gap. So you brought and, that and up. You so Think about that even further, Brian. Uh, Brian. Brian's analogy is spot on. But I, folks, I want you to think water never goes away. So it hardens and then it softens and then it gets absorbed and then it turns into humidity. Then it hardens again and then it falls here. So, so that's a perfect analogy of it. But I want you to think of telegraphing your intention. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful tool that's on your car if you were a driver or even if you're a passenger all the time in the back of an Uber. And it's a little stick that's up by the steering wheel because it's very important. And you can manipulate it with any one of your fingers. And that stick turns on a light that tells people you're going <laughs> to go left or right. If the person that you're following is exceeding the speed limit, there's one, uh, and they're not telegraphing their intentions by giving you the idea, I'm going to go left, I'm going to go right. You can conduct a quick pr predictive analysis. That person is like that in their entire life. Okay. When they drive, they don't care about other people. They don't give themselves the gap. They're uh, uh, inconveniencing people and actually creating a, a havoc. Why? Because they didn't telegraph their intention. Now flip the script. You're standing with the person and you're having a good conversation at the checkout counter. And all of a sudden you notice the person's foot's tapping. Their foot's tapping because they want to go. They're tired of the conversation. Right. So it's a good thing to say, hey, we'll catch up next time and let the person go. Now, if it's not you because their orientation is toward the cashier, Brian, they're waiting for that gosh damn cash to, uh, check to cash. You get what I'm saying? And they're getting frustrated. Uh, again, earlier when we were talking about intent, the fist balled up, the, yes. the human responses, okay? So the harder you try to hide those, the more they stick out, but you telegraph what you're doing well before you know it. So let's put yourself in a boardroom. You're conducting a negotiation. You get what I'm trying to say? You see the person saying something and you're watching their mannerisms and right away you think, oh, I got something on them. So what do you do? You smile or not, or you give a tell like you're playing poker or you do what my, my daughter, Dr. Andrea does and rolls your eyes because I'm so <laughs> stupid, whatever comment. Those telegraph what's really going on behind the scenes. And, and uh, 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 basketball players have learned for a long time to do it right. fake. Yes. They look one way and pass the other way. Why? because they understand the price of telegraphing your intent. You, you won't that, get a three-pointer. You won't get the two. Well, that's a perfect analogy. You know, you go to the quarterback, he can't telegraph where he's throwing that oh, ball. No. Give, give the defensive backs a, a, a split second yep. to, to know exactly where that ball is going. Because, and that those are great examples because they happen at such a, high, just a, such a high rate of speed and it's so fast. And so, exactly. but, but that's so, but even at that level, you know, that defense can read that quarterback and go, Oh, he's thrown to the left side. I better get over there. And sure enough, that's, that, that's where it is. So that's understanding to, uh, the t telegraphing intent and how we do it unknowingly. And when you get to the sports analogy, they, they have to learn how to not do that. Right. The little kids life, learn to play like football, football is a is, game of inches. You're and, exactly and, right. And, and when you're first learning that quarterback's looking exactly yep. at the receiver the whole entire time, right. It, it yep. takes time over time, you know, to get to that higher level to go, all right, that's that we, we have to hide that with them. But, but that takes years and years and years and years of training to go back to unknowingly telegraphing your intent. You know, you yep. brought up the feet. That's a perfect example. I know we've yep. done a whole orientation. Episode, We've yep. done a whole episode on, on body language, but, but your orientation and where you're facing, but especially your feet or, you know, the farthest thing from your brain to the most honest part of your body, they're going to telegraph your intent, whether you want to walk away or you're, you're about to run or whatever that is. So that's right. A, it's, it's a great example. And then, you know, we do that unknowing that's all happening unconsciously. And, and, you know, your turn signal example is, um, I don't think they have those on vehicles in California. Oh my I gosh. Haven't, I haven't seen anyone. Yeah, every, so, so just, this is my history of California. 
everybody in California carries a Frisbee and a golf club and a football with them because the five uh, uh, and the one are always so packed up that you can get out and just stand and play games for an hour and a half the while longer, the accident clears. The longer I live in California, the more every stereotype you've ever heard about California becomes true. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's ridiculous so, and true. So anyway, all right. Next one after telegraphing intent, we have um, cognitive illusions. And you say yeah. cognitive illusions can be overcome with training. But first of all, explain what a cognitive illusion is. Yeah. So cognitive dissonance, cognitive illusion is where your brain has enough information to choose and it chooses prematurely. And the real thing that you're looking at is something completely different or slightly different. So I'll, I'll give you an example. It's turbidity. It's turmoil in your brain uh, uh, because there's enough sense receptors that would tend to show a reasonable person something's happening. You're driving down. We're, we're uh, the Mojave uh, uh, for Mojave Viper. We're, we're up in uh, Stumps, uh, 29 Pumps. So we're driving down the freeway. Sorry, folks. I had to get there too. Uh, driving down the freeway and you're looking down the freeway and it's 110 degrees wet bulb. And all of a sudden you see a, a, a town and trees and buildings and everything. Well, it's, it's not there. What, what happens is the heat monkeys that are coming off are creating shapes. Your brain hates divided attention and certainly hates chaos. So it puts them in order and says, we're coming up to a village that's got a beach and all these other things when actually it's just the heat monkeys coming off of the ground. Mirage, so yeah. anytime, yeah, mirage, we call it a mirage. So, so you have the same thing. A uh, 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 good example of a cognitive illusion is a fundamental attribution error. Uh, you know what? That, that good Kurt Russell uh, is it's such a great actor. Uh, I'm going to vote how he votes on this next proposal. <laughs> Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so right. the, the flipping computer wore tennis shoes. So we're going to follow him on a, a vote for whatever. No. Just because a person is good at one thing, don't attribute, don't don't attribute uh, uh, further further uh, knowledge to that person. So cognitive illusions are things that once we understand, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, then we'll never get fooled by him again. But it takes training. It takes you. You and I don't want to blow this for somebody. So if you got a little kid in a room, get him out of the room. And if you're uh, loving magic, uh, 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 turn down the sound well, for just yeah. a minute. You know, if you're if you're going to do a magic act. Uh, all of the magic acts have uh, 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 an answer, okay? You do this, and then you cut it in half. This knot is already cut. Well, Brian, those are cognitive illusions. They happen well, close enough to our brain that yeah, our brain goes, I, oh, man, and it melds and, those and, things together. And there's th So magic tricks are a great example, right? So it's yep. a type of illusion, okay? So that illusion is, it, you know, some of it, it's both a cognitive illusion and, a, you know, kind of like a, yep. a physiological illusion, right? Yes, or a physical illusion, right? But the idea is with those magic tricks, once you see how it's done, it's you, you'll you, never you, fall you, for you, it. You'll never fall for it, right? Once you know, right? Once you get to peek behind the curtain, you go, oh, I see how they did it. There's a string here, or this is moved here, or they they divided my attention, had me focus over here while they moved that. Well, that one doesn't work anymore. But the thing with cognitive illusions is like a lot of times, even if even if you know, right, it, it's it's not there. Like the mirage is a perfect example. Like I'll yeah. look out ahead, and I know it's a mirage, but no, I see water there, Greg. We're in the desert. And there's water out there. It still fools my exactly. brain. But I had to learn. You know, someone had to show yeah. you. Go, no, hey, you know, there's no water there. That's the scope. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so uh, Brian, I would say, folks, get out your yellow pad and write down Gestalt, G E S T A L T. Yeah. Gestalt has got a, a, an incredible amount of examples of things, the three-legged chair, the, 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 the down back cow. cow the, yeah. yeah and, and I'll tell you, just the ones uh, that fool Shelly all the time, she gets pissed. You know the line, which line is shorter? Because it's got the, yeah. the arrows yep. going the it wrong the way. Arrows, you know? yeah. And, yeah. Okay, so if you understand that your brain and its ability to compute reality can be challenged, then you have to also understand how to overcome that. You know, the, the, uh, another good example, Brian, have you ever bow hunted for carp? Uh, uh, no. A big Detroit thing. <laughs> uh, uh, you take a bow and arrow and you hunt for carp. Well, remember the refraction and reflection and the way that you look at the surface of the water, it changes where the item is underneath the water, right? So yeah. you have to aim in a different spot, understanding that your brain is feeling a cognitive I, illusion. Okay. I've seen people fish with an rpg yeah yeah it exactly worked, but uh, they, they, they used to be called cci fishermen with the 44 mag uh, uh but listen uh, i'll give you one more um your brain and and your uh, uh senses are 
set up to create homeostasis in every environment. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you're drunk, you're actually fighting that. And that's why yes. we walk funny, right? Yeah. So there's a thing called the rotor, R-O-T-O-R. -O -O and it was at uh, Cedar Point back when I was a kid. I'm remembering 45 years ago, Brian. And everybody that got in the rotor, the rotor spin, and then the floor dropped out. Yeah, I know what you're And talking everybody about. Yeah. power vomited like a yeah. rainbird yeah. sprinkler. Why? Because all of your body systems were overwhelmed by the environment and the illusion was, I can't control it anymore. And when you can't control it anymore, your body is going to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And how does it tell you that? You're going to vomit. This is not fun. This has ceased to be cool. I need to go back to standing on level ground, right? So so, so all of those things can be overcome with training. Uh, uh, listen, they actually take NASA pilots up in a, a C-130 and do the zero Gs yeah. all day long yeah, until yeah. they blow junk, right? Why? Because they want to make sure that they can handle that. That's a form of human performance training, overcoming a cognitive bias. Okay. All right. So, so that's, that kind of covers a uh, uh, cognitive illusion. So the, the, yeah. the next one you have on here is affiliations and you okay. say humans betray their affiliations unknowingly. So what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by affiliations? What do you mean? We, we betray yep. them. So, an affiliation is any uh, uh, known, intended, or unintentional uh, relationship between other humans sociological uh, in, in an environment, sociologically within an environment or a, a, a baseline, let's call it. So the idea is that, that people react to other people uh, uh, differently. If you're walking down the sidewalk and a person's coming towards you and your onboard system uh, senses danger, you'll cross the street. You know, you'll walk faster. Uh, you'll do uh, different things. Why? Because your system is alerted that that affiliation is that's going to be a bad relationship. Whereas you could be in a bar and you see a group of people laughing and talking, and maybe you'll take your drink and go over and see what's going on there because you want to be associated, affiliated with them in some manner. So it's to fill a sociological, psychological, or physiological need. Uh, uh, what uh, breeding? You get what I'm trying to say. But ideas are that you can uh, betray that affiliation without even knowing you're doing it. So yeah. uh, quick one, uh, school circle. Mm -hmm. We're all standing in school circle. We're standing at a bar and all of a sudden you'll see so think one of, person. Like, we mean just like school circle. Yeah, a bar like is a, group a training of people, environment. Like, four, yeah, yeah, four or yeah. five people standing around yeah, in a circle exactly. talking like a normal conversation. Yeah, with their feet and their yeah. orientation pointed towards each other. Yeah. So they're all talking and they're all laughing. Now, the person that wants to talk next, watch their foot. Their foot will get jumpy and they'll put their foot further into the circle like they're put your right foot in and put your left foot out. And they'll start manipulating their hair and moving their hand. Why? They're so excited by all the axons and dendrites and the connections that are hot in their brain that they want to spit out the next thing that's going on. Well, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, I'm with this group. I'm affiliated with this group and I want to talk now. Yeah. So I want to be somewhere in a hierarchy. Well, what do hierarchies mean? We came up a long time ago with the MADE acronym. Anybody else that tells you that they made it up, they're full of shit because <laughs> I'm the first one that write it down and MADE came from being a MADE guy. You're a MADE man if you can figure this out. So it's a double entendre of sorts. And it stood for, Brian, mimicry, adoration, direction, and entourage. And, and most of those have an above or a below, right? Right. Uh, so, so, so adoration can be a, a positive or a negative. And somebody goes, yeah, but negative adoration would be hate or death or fear. Yeah, but it doesn't fit the acronym, asshole. So <laughs> back off for a minute. I get pissed when people talk about that because they're trying to invent stuff that's already been invented. So mimicry, do you act like the person that's with you? Do you wear right. the same clothing? Be clothing that could be, yeah. How physically, you, you, right? Because you, you'll, okay. you'll, we look at that as just a, when you see people communicating that yep. way, when they have similar mannerisms, maybe moving their hand or whatever, like, um, you, you'll see that mimicry. We know there's good communication. Yep. That's a normal part of how humans interact, right? We start yes. to mimic whether they're the way we speak or yes. we'll start to do the up speak if someone else is doing it. You're exactly <laughs> right. And, and we won't lose it uh, for yeah. a while until we're away from that person. And Brian, that can even be catchphrases. A person has a, a little catchphrase that you, you know, that stinking ugly, you know, whatever. And yeah. then you start using stinking, yeah. uh, you know, and you're going, why did I use that? Well, that's it. That also is a function of the mimicry, mimicry and the adoration. Yes. And you adore somebody thinking of it that you want to be like that person. You want to act as though that person, you do the face platter, you smile and laugh at their jokes. Now it can be negative adoration as well. You spit on the ground or you rip your clothes when that person comes by, or you absent yourself when uncle Paul comes to the, 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 uh, you know, group, uh, uh, uh meeting and then direction. 
whether a person opens the door for you or the person pulls out a chair for you or, or the person responds before you even ask for something by, by handing you a, a cup of coffee that they know is your brand. That's got mimicry, adoration and direction all in there. OK, I, I don't physically have to point to you and go, yeah, hey, you you're doing it. Go do but this. if I do that, guess what? That's even more proof. Because yeah. if I can point to like, like I would never imagine ever pointing to Brian and go, Hey, go get me a whatever. Okay. Yeah. Brian would be like all up in my grill <laughs> yeah. going, what? <laughs> how, how get you it yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It would be ugly. Okay. But you know that if another person nodded and was already on the way, okay, then you have direction. So you have M A and D mimicry, adoration and direction. And guess what, Brian, three out of four positive signal. But guess what? The fourth one is the fourth one is we walk around all day long and we don't have theme music. And we don't have people following us. Right. Okay. If you do, you're either a wanted criminal or a celebrity. Okay. Yeah. That's called the E, the entourage. People that walk around and follow you and they, why do they follow you, Brian? Because you can get them money, you can get them laid, you can get them drugs, you can get them booze, you yeah. can get them uh, laughing. Okay. There's a whole bunch of different things that they can get you, but watch how those people tend to follow you around. We don't have that. So a person that's got the M A D E, they're probably your top person. Okay. And you can actually categorize that hierarchy right. by watching and, and saying he has more of this and she has more of that. So she's the CEO and this guy's probably her shot caller. You, you right. See where I'm yeah. Going? And, you're, and you're talking about kind of creating a hierarchy in a group, which happens yep. naturally in every group. I don't care if it's little kids, if it's a team, whatever, even though yep. there might be a built in structure, let's say military or police, like there's a, there's already a set built in structure. But then you can start to identify, well, that person outranks that other person, but they kind of exactly. have a lot more say in that group of what's going on, right? You can yep. you can see that, right? And, you know, you talk about betraying those affiliations unknowingly. We're, we're doing that sort of unconsciously, right? Yes. We will defer to the leader of the group uh, when something comes up. Or even, like you said, with the, with the school circle thing, um, it's it's like uh, you, you can you can look down at where people are standing. If you get a group of people, the people in that group who know each other a little bit better, they're going to be a little bit closer to each other, right? They're going to be standing. Yep. Literally, their feet will be a little bit closer than someone else. So um, that is all happening, like we said, uh, unconsciously. Uh, right? perfect, we, perfect example. You're you're spot on again. Uh, we were uh, recently doing a course uh, uh, back east, and and somebody showed up back east right in the middle of the course, and they were unexpected at the time. It wasn't during a break. It was right in the middle while we were both on transmit and we're moving the crowd and having a good time. And the person came in, we both know, and we both love. And it created a huge ripple in the room. Yeah. So everybody could see that immediately there was a change, right? Yeah. Okay. So this person somehow is more important than all you heathens in the room <laughs> because we stopped what we were doing to greet that person and welcome them. Now, immediately that person sat down and we went on with the rest of the course. So they weren't our boss. Do you right. know what I'm saying? They were important to us, but they weren't our contemporary. Why is that important? So you know how to navigate the physiological and sociological in a, in a meeting and get your goal accomplished, right? Right, right. Okay, so yeah, these are the, uh, the affiliation ones that are huge. We do that in a number of different ways, like you said, yep. and the way we talk, the way we act, the way we mimic each other, the clothes we wear. You know, we always can, can walk into a place and we see a, gr a new group of people and we can tell whether they're like a high functioning team and they're working it. together. Sometimes just, by the way, you'll see like they all the same haircut. They're wearing basically the same clothes. They're all like in the same kind of shape. And we're like, okay, the, this group, all, they spend a lot of time together and they work together well because there's no, there's no dissonance yep. in there. There's not one person yep. who looks and acts completely different. There's no, like, these are natural things sociologically that happen with a group. It's like when you see a family out and they all start to start to look the same, they're all wearing almost the same color yep. shirt or pants or similar shoes. And you're like, geez, like you'd pick them out in a crowd and they're not let's even take, realizing they're doing it. Let's take an extra minute on that on zoom uh, uh, or emails. Uh, remember, you don't have to actually physically see the person to create a behavior profile. So uh, Zoom meetings, uh, uh, when people are constantly switching the, and, and, and this is just a thing that we get into because we sometimes have a, a CEO on that was a former general that's yeah. also a friend of somebody else. And so when you, when you have too much of the sir, and then you're slipping back and forth to the general, but the other guys call them Larry and they're having a good laugh. Right. That's uncomfortable. Why is it uncomfortable? Because it's a low functioning unit. Why? Because they have a low level of organization. What does that mean? That they're all on the call together, still figuring out sociologically who's who. Yeah, who's who. Yeah, and, yeah. and guess what, Brian? That takes time. That takes money. That's inefficient. So now we look at it even on an email. 
And so we send an email and, and the first four sentences are platitudes. Yeah. Hey, great to see you at the beach today, Senator, this and that. Yeah, that's all horseshit that doesn't need to be there. Why do we do it, though? Because there's a hierarchy in every yeah. group. And, and groups that do it well, Brian, it's smooth and efficient. Groups that don't are constantly fighting. And guess what? It's a lot of extra words and a lot of extra time to make people feel welcome. That's not what the MADE acronym is about. MADE acronym is to figure out humans and the relationships to other humans, whether they know it or not. And that way you can manipulate, let's not use that word, <laughs> you can modify your behavior uh, uh, to gain an advantage. And what's the advantage that we want to gain? We want to be a better friend. We want to be a better parent. We want to anticipate right. danger or an opportunity. People get us wrong thinking that, oh, you mean you're going to manipulate the yeah. terrain as a restaurant to gain it's, an advantage. It's, yeah, to gain yeah. an advantage, to calm you down so I can get the information the, out of you and I need the, to find a missing kid. You know, the, the term manipulate is not a negative term. Um, so Cert certainly I, not scientifically. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I manipulate the door in a refrigerator many times a day. Exactly. You know exactly. I manipulate that oven, you know, all the yeah, time to get my food, so true. food in there. Now right, I'm so, hungry again. So, so the so the next one is is a is a big one. We talk about it a lot and it's about memory. And you simply yeah. wrote, memory is fiction. I, I yep. and I cannot stress this enough. It's something I always, always have to tell everyone like your world and the way you think it is is not reality it's your and certainly reality. not the way the rest of the world uh, and sees everyone it. Yeah, sees yeah. it differently there's objective yep. reality and what you think so yep. you know what we think and experience and see and feel is is so so entirely subjective that we this is why would there's so much discourse sometimes and people you yes. know think the wrong thing it's like you're not seeing the world for what it is but but none of us are. So you have to take that into account. So explain your version of what you mean when you say memory is fiction. Because what do you mean? I can remember a lot of stuff from when I was a little kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I had stuff that happened. I remember, you know, uh, the my first concussion ever. I was six, yep. you know, and I was at my uh, you know, you know, grandparents' knuckles. farm. No, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I went barreling down this road with my cousins on bikes and I fell and I busted my head open. And I had to go to the hospital. I remember all that stuff, Greg, you right. tell me, I don't remember the color of my, my grandma's new rug that I threw up all over because I was so heavily concussed. Like I remember yeah. that stuff. I remember every detail, right? Every detail that you remember is a detail that gets better with age because you keep reinventing the memory. Right. Every time that memory comes out of that file folder, you add uh, the favorite, I love asparagus. And I remember the first smell on that carpet when I vomited was asparagus. Listen, as a kid, you didn't even know what asparagus was, right. but the idea is that you've accumulated all these additional memories and those memories bleed over into them. And guess what? Uh, uh, even when you're on a stand and somebody says, uh, you know, take the oath, uh, what you're doing is you're recreating what you think you saw felt and tasted at that time based on all of the emotions you have. So if you have 90% of your emotions are based on this and 10% on that one concussion when you were a kid, that 90 is going to weigh heavily on that 10, Brian. And it's going to create lapses in memory that your brain hates to have a hole in a memory. So it's going to fill. And what's it going to fill it with? Uh, it's a wonderful life. It's going to fill yeah. it with uh, a new zoo review. It's going to fill it with like, I'll, I'll tell you the one that everybody out there knows. Have you ever related a story about how much you love your significant other? And at the end of the story, your significant other goes, that wasn't, that wasn't me, that me. was your previous one. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because we associate good things. We want that yes. dopamine. We want to feel good about the situation and that can be harmful. It can create a bias to your memory. And, and so, and memory is just horribly awful like that. And, you know, we, we remember things the way we want to be remembered and all yes. humans are somewhat egocentric to a point. So this is where you get into how the story changes over time. Like you just said, yeah. the one, Hey babe, remember when we came here and we had that amazing meal and remember we had a funny bartender and we sat here laughing. It's like, no, that was someone else you dated. Yep, so you I replaced it. my wife with someone else because I wanted but not, that memory. not nefariously. No. And you didn't want to be mean in fact, about it. In you fact, just, the, the opposite. I actually be a compliment. wanted, I wanted, it was a compliment to, I'm now inserting her into they don't really see it great as a memory. No, they don't. They, don't <laughs> they, don't see it as a they definitely do not. That. And and there's a bunch of stuff with, with memory too. Like, you know, we, we technically, you can store a I don't even know endless amounts of information memory, but what, what becomes difficult is recall, right? That recall yes. of what that is. And, and this is where it gets into 
we might remember major muscle movements, but individual little things, they're going to get changed around. And this happens where, you know, sometimes what, what gets into, like I would say, nothing ruins a, 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 war, a good war story like another witness. You got cause, it. Because what happens is you, you're not recall when you when you're remembering something, you're not recalling back to that event, you're recalling back to the last time you recalled that event the last time you remembered it. it and that story can change over time if suddenly it was there was three people there and then a year later like yeah i think there's like four or five guys that well the next time you tell that story that now it starts at four or five so then you might add another one and it's like the fishing story you know i once caught a fish this big you know what i mean and then that fish grows and grows and it. grows and grows but every you time don't too. know that right. you're doing it <clears throat> you don't and therefore it feels robust it feels real brian that's the that's the key I, I, and I'll, I'll tell you another thing. Listen, folks, I'm old now. So I yellow pad everything. I've got yellow pads all over the house. Yeah. And if I get an idea, I stop and I write it down. And I'll tell you what I do. I write it down completely. Why? Because I've got all of these notepads that yeah. I find when I'm going back through my notes. And it said, Johnny has one with an arrow to the right. <laughs> and I look and above it, I'm in a negotiation. Do you get what I'm saying? Then I drew the circles of the people at the table then I met, made an X for right. Johnny. Then I wrote to myself, Johnny has one with the arrow. And then it's a completely different thing. But it was important enough to write it down, signify who Johnny was and put the arrow. And now I can't use that memory, Brian. Right. I have no idea what the context what of that memory was, right? So, so don't fall for that. And, and your imagination, uh, 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 you've heard the term, your imagination runs away with you. For a good reason. You want to be the protagonist of your story. You want to be the center of your universe. You want to have things that are wonderful memories where you came and you weren't the one that shit in the, the punch bowl. You're the one that found it and stopped everybody from drinking and, 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 and uh, saved the world. So if you know there's that much pressure on you and you know there's a limit to what you can see, how much you can hear, like, like uh, auditory exclusion. Well, mm -hmm. how many shots were fired? Oh, man, there must have been nine or 11 shots that were fired. Okay. Right. Uh, 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 do you routinely do that? Okay. Well, we know the brain hates divided attention. So were you counting or were you running? So I'm always suspicious when I'm talking to somebody, you get what yeah, I'm trying to and, say. Uh, and, and we, we will fill in details that didn't happen. And again, like you said, it's not someone trying to lie. They have no nefarious intent. It's literally no. making order out of chaos. It's your brain goes, I need exactly. a complete picture. However, we did not get one at the time of events. So, I so I'm going to make one up. Yeah. And exactly that can involve right. stuff from movies that you've seen before, other stories that people have told you before, um, other events that had nothing to do with it. They sort of get, get kind of mixed around in there. So you might have some major muscle movements correct, you know, but, yes. but when it gets like your concussion, those, yeah, your concussion, I, that happened. You remember I fell the off the bike. Here's you remember about you were on the farm. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Uh, uh, but, but when you get the, the finer granularity, unless there was a memory and emotion link that was so profound, it's unlikely that that's exactly true. Now, what things help us? Notes, photographs, videotape. Right. You get what I'm trying to say? So, so that's why just an axon body camera alone uh, uh, doesn't fill in everything around, but it can help me get the sequence correct, right? Because what's one of the first things that that fails in our memory? The sequence. This yep. happened. Then this happened. No, uh, 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 traffic accident. Uh, listen, man, I heard the screeching brakes. I looked over and saw the crash. Then I looked up to the light, and it was green for north to south. Well, it probably wasn't green for north to south when it was happening. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So that alone, that factor alone, Brian, if I testify to it, I would be wrong without knowing I'm wrong. So memory is fiction. It's whatever is the best story at the time that you're recalling that specific memory. Okay. And then that kind of leads right into the next one about habit, because yes. you have habit and said memory and emotion links make humans creatures of habit. So yep. we talked about, you know, predictability and what we talked about is obviously human behavior pattern recognition and you know we're creatures of habit pattern becomes pattern behavior is what becomes a habit right we call that a habit is just a pattern of behavior basically um but what what do you do you mean by that because you brought yeah. up memory emotion links and, and memory so let's explain what that is exactly then... so a memory and emotion link means that that something occurs that's so new or so novel or so profound or so exciting or so scary or so dangerous that it gets a whole bunch of chemicals in your brain excited and when those are excited, it's easier short term to remember that incident and vividly remember it and recall what's going on. So a habit is a sense 
that you liked something before, so you're likely to like it again. So predictability is that I'll go to City Market to shop. I'll get the biggest cart they have. I'll do the cleaner on the rail. I'll make sure that I start at the right and end with the frozen foods. Why? Because I don't want them to thaw before I get to my car. That's predictability. And humans are, are remarkably predictable. But habit means, Brian, I like to go to bed around this time right. because I know I get about this much to uh, sleep. Okay. And somebody said, yes, but that's predictable. Yeah. But it's a different part of your brain that's yeah. running it. You get what I'm trying to say? It's not the least calorie intervention to go to that place. And I just go more and more. It's that something about that memory was so profound that it's a thing that I do. Like people do this. And, and I always hear the, uh, I'm crossing my arms, folks. And, and I always hear the, 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 the uh, uh, kinesics. Uh, Charlatans. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, the parlor trick ones. And they're going, that person's not buying uh, uh, what you're selling. Well, this is a comfort signal. Yeah. This means that the person is completely comfortable inside of them. You're not coming in. I'm not coming out because I'm perfect. If I had a blanket, I'd probably be sleeping, right? Yeah. Uh, now, what's another thing it could mean? It could mean the temperature in the room has changed. So, so uh, and I'm cold, right? So don't force something where it doesn't fit. And habit is a perfect one. Uh, uh, what do we do uh, around Christmas in our house? Do we have eggnog? Do we have uh, uh, roast beast? Uh, do we sing Damu Doris from the Grinch? Those are things that become habit. And after a while, those habits, now that's not, uh, uh, somebody would say, yes, but I can predict you're likely to do it. Yeah, you're predicting it. I get it. That's putting it on a calendar and saying what events are going to happen in what sequence. But the habits, the ex exact chemistry inside the human that drives it. And that's based on your previous encounters with that information. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, that's like you said, we're, we're creatures of habit. This goes back to, like you said, our, it's a, it, most decisions are made at some sort of survival level, right? Yes. Of why we, um, why we create the patterns of behavior that we do, right? Be, and, and what you keep referring to is the memory emotion links, which yep. is, you know, some, something occurred, right? And it, it triggered a whole bunch of electrochemical neurotransmitters during that event. It became yep. very powerful. So that memory emotion link, meaning that I, I, that myelination happened, I created some synapse that said, Hey, when this occurs, I'm going to do this because that's what we've done over and over again. And it worked and we really liked it. And we got rewarded yep. out of it. That becomes a habit, right? Yep. And exactly. that, that, that that's, and, and that memory emotion link could be something tragic. It could be something funny. It could just be through repetition over and over again, right? Of whatever, like it's the, the, the going to bed example is a perfect one, man. I started yep. going to bed earlier. I started getting better sleep. I started being happier. Exactly. I got more rested. I was able to do more. Okay. Well, once I start doing that, it's really hard. You know, I always do the people do the same thing, like, like to get up early. I like to get up early. You get up early. Um, it's worked for me in so many different contexts and so many different places to be up yep. before that sun comes up, start my day off. Right. I can't not do that. So when I try yep. to sleep in, I, I can't yeah, it sleep fails. in. It's a miserable be, fail. Be, because I have that habit. Now, it's so ingrained, it would take me very, very long to then break that habit, to, to, yeah, to yeah, just so, try and so, lay in bed, you know, exactly. for, for weeks or months to, to, to get my body just to not wake up early. Another limited objective experiment. If I'm uh, uh, in a group of smokers, all I have to do, and it's predictable, to get the uh, response that I want is touch my pocket where my cigarettes are. I don't smoke, haven't for years, but where I used to keep cigarettes and a lighter, I would touch that pocket and fumble around for a second and everybody in the room would wanna take a break and go smoke. Right. Uh, if you don't believe that, do a limited objective experiment. Uh, what you're doing is during meeting, just glance down at your phone for a second right. and then go to the, everybody in the will. next couple of seconds will do that. So those are predictable, those aren't habit. Habits form over time, right? But if you say, I want everybody before this meeting to put your phone in a box and we're going to keep the box outside and go do your meeting, okay, predictably, the habit is so strong, they'll be searching for their phone and feel completely uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, predictability. Uh, Shelly uh, loved her grandma Manelli and, and grandpa Bruno immensely. There was no way that you wouldn't understand how much uh, she talks about them all the time, all this other stuff. So predictability, I know that somewhere in the house, Shelly's going to have uh, Grandpa Bruno and, and Grandma Nelly shrine. You get what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm conducting predictive analysis. But the habit is that every time Shelly comes in, she kisses her finger and touches the thing over the mantle and says, love you, Gramps, or whatever. You yeah. see the difference? Okay. So right. you can predict I a behavior 
You get what I'm saying? It's likely, but a habit is something that you don't even know you're doing. And it's like being that gopher on that wheel. And the gopher, what kind of animal would that be? Horse? <laughs> a hamster? I don't know. Hamster, there we go. I guess it. you could probably put a gopher on there. It'd be a bigger wheel. Yeah, um, no, no. And, it, and that's good, you know, a good point because you brought up, you know, a habit isn't habit isn't necessarily good or bad could be nope. anything right there's good the habits thing. there's bad habits it's just that pattern of behavior the memory emotion link so yep. you try to create habits of thought habits of action to allow that are you in to syncopation yeah that, and that, that are good that are congruent and that are good and that, exactly. that allow you to do whatever it is you're trying to do whether that's yep. to you know work out more eat healthier uh, and, all that and that's stuff. the thing what you just hit is not predictable. So it's predictable if I eat a lot of calories and I am sedentary, I'm going to get fat. Right. Okay. But a habit is I get up every single morning and head down to the, the home gym because I've got to. And, and, and if I don't, I'll be, you know, Orson Wellian in proportions and explode like the Zeppelin, right? The grass <laughs> feet. So the, so the idea is, Oh, the one humanity is prediction. Yeah, exactly. That's what Shelly yells every time. And, <laughs> and uh, Brian one is a habit. So there's a clear definition a definition with a distinction, even though that distinction is fine. And it's good stuff to remember because you can predict or, or uh, uh, feed a habit or destroy a habit based on your, you know, your continued human performance. Okay. So the last one you have is training and what our motto is, uh, you know, yeah. training changes behavior, trademark, don't try to steal it, but training changes behavior, right? Well, so first of all, um, let de define training and then what you mean training changes behavior because yeah. you know, everyone thinks training is like a okay i'm either at the gym training for an event or a thing or uh i'm at the shooting range training uh, yeah, yeah we like, misuse like, a lot like of we, like it, meaning it doesn't always have to be something like that so, um, so your training education. like like your your phone is is teaching you it's training it's you to teacher. do something yeah so right. but, i would start there with maybe a definition so i, I i'll give you an example education imparts a viewpoint mm -hmm. education imparts uh, uh we use it all the time a platitude an ideal or knowledge you get what i'm trying to like say i, I can a learn form of knowledge. concepts yeah. right exactly and i can sit back in my chair and think about what i just read and go that makes perfect sense it's completely logical yeah i like it i don't like it uh and we live sometimes through those literary characters don't we okay mm -hmm. but the idea is training imparts a skill okay so i can read how to ride a bike i can read how to swim okay but without actually going out and getting into those arenas getting on yeah. a bike on a sidewalk or getting in a pool or an ocean okay you haven't learned the skill you can't take that skill and say i've now had this newly minted skill so theory is great and and educational theory and understanding how to solve the problems is brilliant but until you've solved the problem, until you've taken away that negotiation, until you've uh, uh, talked that de-escalation, you get what I'm trying to say, uh, it's a different theory. So, so training, for example, they say uh, training is tap, rack, bang. Uh, training is uh, uh, you know, uh, not going to your gun when you're going for your taser, all that other stuff. No, uh, uh, unless you've done it an equal amount of times and your brain is fluent with it. But then, even then, it's only muscle memory. So right. training means... Training means the entire experience, Brian. So I'll give you an example. There's a place in Madison Heights. God, I haven't been there in 35, 40 years uh, uh, called Bruno's. It's a bar that's right off the freeway. When you first come into Bruno's, you have that hint of sage in the background, okay? And you hear the person playing the piano, fly me to the moon, but ding, 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 ding. Bruno himself comes up. And if he knows your name, he'll say it. If not, he says, welcome friends, I'm Bruno. This is my restaurant. Come on in. He introduces you to a place that, that, that you're going to sit and the guy that's going to seat. And here's the thing. And it's no pressure. Take your time when you want us, you know, give us an indication and we'll cook whatever it is. Brian, from the very beginning, what he does is he's training you. He's teaching you mm -hmm. how to behave in his place. Okay. He's saying, this is a full open sense of who I am. And this is a, okay. What that is, is that's not education. That that's is yep. training. He's training you. I will sit you here. You will do these things. And when you walk in the next time, guess what you're going to do? You're going to repeat that behavior. It changes how you see that environment. It changes. Uh, 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 I was a cop for almost 40 years. You get what I'm saying? Almost 30 years, rather. And, and uh, you look at 27 to 30. I'm doing the math. And still, Brian, when I see a car at the side of the road that could be a police car, I go to 10 and 2. Right. I check my speedometer. I go down. 
Why? Is that education? No, it's training. Because I know that that car is going to cause all of these different things and I'm going to get pulled over and it's going to come out of my wallet or whatever. So the difference is that you're no longer doing it in the theoretical or the metaphorical. You're actually doing it, doing the skill in the moment. No, and I, I love the example of, of, of Bruno's restaurant example. Because yep. that's, that's, this is, I don't want to get off on a tangent on, on what's going on in the restaurant industry right now, but I think it's yeah. a perfect industry that, that, that should, should listen to that example. Because what you're doing is he's, he's teaching you what's important to him, yep. how he wants to be treated, what's important at the restaurant. And he's teaching you, you know, what you can and cannot do. Now, it, it's not in a list saying, hey, look, listen up. This is, these are the rules here. This right. No, you don't have not to do it all. that way. In you fact, know, that's the worst fact, way to were, do it. You were drawn in. You had to see what was going to happen next. That but, was the amazing thing about the story of Bruno's. You know, but, but, it was an experience, Brian. No, and, and that's the whole part is the training. We always talk about creating a training experience, right? And, and, and what that actually means. So he's teaching you all that stuff. Well, one of the things we always talk about too, with, that we use is people teach you how they want to be treated. And Absolutely. that's an exact perfect example of what it is. So, so how you act and the way you address people and the way you talk to them, the pitch tone and inflection of your voice, the clothes you wear, all that builds into where you it, stand, where how what your you stand. posture yeah. is, exactly. Uh, um, you know, we, all your mannerisms go into what people think of you. I mean, whether you realize it or not, and this which yep. gets, which goes into all the unconscious stuff that we've already talked about. But the training part is, is how do you, how do you change that? Or how do you get that point across? It's the same thing I do with the, the little insurgent, right? I don't, yep. there's no, Hey, you will do this at this time. And here's a list of things. It's, it's, we just build, build some habits into the day. And I train her, I show her like, Hey, look, this yep. is how you, this is where everything goes in your room. And you know, you have to do that before you go out and play. But I let her do that. If that's when she gets out of bed first thing in the morning, she decides to all be all over it, or she's sitting there going slow and grabbing some breakfast and wanting to do her own thing. That's fine. She knows yes. what needs to be done because I've trained her accordingly, but just by showing it and that demonstrating that stuff is a training program. Anything can be a training. Exactly. Program. You can, you can do it. You can build those repetitions in, in no matter what it is, you know, uh, as simple as, is, you know, uh, with, with phone calls or something with people, like if I don't wait more than a couple minutes on a zoom call and then I'm done, if they get back and say, Hey, sorry, I was five minutes late and you weren't on there anymore. Okay. I'm training them. Yeah. I'm not, that's unacceptable yep. to me. That's an unacceptable standard that you're going to waste my time. So yep. either a, they learn and they See correct it or they don't. And, and then it's right. over. But, but that's the idea is I'm teaching them, I'm training them what's important to me. You're spot on. So, so rake the leaves and you'll get a quarter. That was a, a, our allowance back in the day it was a quarter for the week, rake the leaves. So my dad, former Marine, God rest his soul. Uh, and, and I showed you all the, all the family members there over the weekend, Brian. But uh, uh, my dad uh, set out a baseball bat, a coal shovel and a rake. And he set it in the backyard and he had Jeff and I come out. Brian was off, uh, you know, doing whatever Brian did. He was the golden uh, uh, son. And uh, dad says, okay, assholes. That was our name, Jeff mm -hmm. and I, uh, which one of these tools is going to be most efficient at raking. And Jeff would always go the bat and dad would, <laughs> you know, give him some knuckle. And uh, uh, I would say, wow, wow, dad, it seems as though the rake would be the best. And dad would go, yeah, now, how you pick it up? Dad would pick it up by the tines and he would poke us in the check with chest with the handle. And, and dad went through this series of things to make it viscerally real. Yeah. What, what raking meant? Where do you start? Where do they end up? If you don't put the plastic underneath them, then what are you going to do with the yes. leaves? Some can be mulched into the garden. It was this entire learning experience. And you're going to go, yeah, it was interspersed with education. It certainly was. But the training was yep. modules. This is the tool. This is the day this is the environment. And then he repeated it. And guess what he would do? He'd come out and check our work. This is good. Now you see what you did over here. That went on, uh, you know, Hattie's yard. So you can't do that because then the neighbor's going to be pissed. There was a lesson in everything, Brian, and you could have read it, you know, but doing it, that was the difference doing it. Now I walked away with that sense of accomplishment. And guess what? When I was faced with a similar circumstance, I figured that new circumstance out the same way. That's a benefit of training. No, and, and that's that's another another uh, 
great example of what we mean by it. It doesn't have to be as formal as people think it is. I don't think nope. your dad wrote out his lesson plan and then and then nope. submitted it and then to someone and then created. So, no, it's just, but he went through each each process, each step. Even Bruno had his way yes. of doing things. He probably didn't have to write that down unless he was showing the next guy that he wanted as the manager, the next woman that he wanted as manager. Certainly. Hey, this is what you're going to do. Let me show yep. you how you're going to greet people. And that's that's exactly exactly what we're talking about those training yep. moments like that and and like you always say you know any anything is a teachable moment anything can oh be my trained. gosh like, do every, we do that? how many times during the day do we, you and i throw that out and we just nod now that hey yeah. there's a perfect yeah. teachable yeah. moment we, Go. we can, we can you know? stop right here and stop everything yep. that we're doing look this is why this occurs and this is what it is so and and i keep that you know ev everything in life is like that you know i do that with a little one as well all right hey did you see why the dog did this uh instead of what Take she normally name. does you know, do that hip pocket. Uh, Brian, I'm so behind you on this one. Listen, if you're in the moment, you see something, stop, stop, take a knee, go look at that tire tread. That's not from that car. How long has this car been here? Well, it was before the snow. No, it, and, and, you know, it, th those are wonderful it's opportunities. The same, same thing. When I, the first time I ever had explosives training was learning how to use debt cord was with 550 cord, green paracord. There you go. And I learned how to do tie every type of different small charges uh, to blow small stuff up. Did it a bunch of times. So guess what? When we finally went to the demo range, already done. Here we go. Yep. Let there, did, Here did, is did, a pigtail splice. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's wonderful. Yeah. So, so we, we've kind of, we've, we've gone through um, all of these, right? We've gone through these, these 10. Um, what would be your, your guidance sort of, if I've been listening to this and yeah, taking so this notes a, and, and going through and saying, all right, well, well, you know, so what, or how do I use this or what am I supposed to do with it? Kind of like, what, what can I get out of this? Because yeah. we can re realistically, we could take each one and do an entire podcast episode on it. But, but I thought it was better just to kind of get all of them out there like this. So if I've, I've no, got my I, yellow pad out, what, what, what's, what are some of my takeaways here and how to use this? I would take the next 10 minutes after you hang up or quit or whatever. I don't know. The social media. <laughs> it it and ends. The show I, ends. I would, yeah. Somehow. Yeah. And I would take, and I would put each one of these on an individual page of my diary. And every single time I encounter something, I would add it and don't be afraid because sometimes it could be, uh, it's going to be in predictability and habit, but then you're going to go, wait a minute, this one's predictability, habit and memory. That's good. Rewrite it because when you say it, see it, write it, read it, uh, uh and repeat it, uh, you're going to remember it even better, you know, recall it, uh, uh, when you need to. And what I'm saying, Brian, is I'm saying, thinking of, think of them as bins, they're yep. big open bins that you can uh, throw the rolled up yellow pad into like a basketball hoop, right? And then go back uh, occasionally and take a look at it and say, am I being predictable in this moment? Have I established an affiliation at my church? Uh, am I subject to a cognitive illusion? Do you get what I'm saying? Mastery comes from using the language, not just understanding where the Spanish to English dictionary is in your bedroom. No, you know? and, and that's exactly what, what I would have said too, is right. So let's take each one of these that we went over, yeah, 10 different pieces of paper, and I've got attention. Humans won't pay attention unless they have to. Boom, that's my first one. Like you said, I took those different, I would say, externally and internally. What have I yeah. seen from other people? How do I fall into this bin? And you just start writing those examples. And like you yeah. said, some are going to fall into multiple buckets and that's fine that's how it's supposed to be right and they, they they interweave together and then now after over time after month you're gonna sit there and go holy crap i'm a master at all 10 of these things right I, exactly. i've seen it everywhere but I go. there's always room to get better there's there's always always room another yellow pad right there's yeah, always there is. Room for, for so, so I'll, give, I'll give you a quick example in telegraphing intent uh put stuff that you don't normally like like uh, Brian and I don't watch a, a lot of television. Brian's got a streaming thing that he does when there's something good on. I love documentaries. I, I yeah. absolutely love learning about stuff. Uh, uh, but waiting for the documentary to come on, there was some ridiculous movie with that Stiller, uh, 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 Jerry Stiller's kid, Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller. And if you know who Ben Stiller is, folks, I, I don't know the movie, but there's a one where he's trying to get in to see a girl that's in a, a high rise business. And he comes through the revolving doors, which is hilarious. And he encounters the same security guard over and over again. And it's Refrigerator Perry. I mean, it's not, but it's a huge guy that's just gigantic. And so uh, uh, Stiller tries to get around the guy. And so Stiller tries to fake to the left, spin around, do all those other things. Well, what he's doing, folks, is he's telegraphing his intent. I can write down that scene from that movie and just jot, jot down a couple of notes. So when I come back to telegraphing intent, I grin, I go, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. And that opens the door, Brian, to those files. So every time 
that you see one, it's not going to be an Oscar winning movie scene. Sometimes it's going to be a dog shitting in the yard. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be you, me telling you this morning, you remember about the Christmas tree? Uh, <laughs> oh, is that a habit? No, it's because I couldn't bend over, right? Those type of things that happen to us have to be written down. They have to be collated and referred to. That's how, how do you become a subject matter expert? Okay, from all that scar tissue. Right. Well, guess what? When the scar tissue, when you account for all of that, the person says, where's your certificate? Where's your book? Where's your, you know, learning and all that stuff. And that's why you and I hate those gosh damn certificate yeah. notes. Everything's yeah. a certificate and a membership now. I would rather say, show me your notes and have you pull out a book that has all kind of little things written in the margins and everything. That's what makes you a subject matter expert. Exactly. No, that's, and that's a, that's a, that's a great point to kind of, kind of end on. You have to personalize yeah. the information anyway. Um, it's the same thing with anything you're learning. You, if you don't make it something that you use and you do and that pertains to your specific life, good luck learning it. I mean, it's why, well, why do people have such a hard time learning a, a foreign language? Well, not until they get to that country, then all of a sudden, well, wow, yes. we're picking it up pretty quick. Why? Because you have to out of survival. You got so it. so you got it's, it. it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's another example, but um, <clears throat> so that's that's kind of these these 10 i know we wanted to do one on this um if you're listening there's a whole bunch more on our patreon site and it's only a few bucks a month and we put a lot of stuff on there and so there's plenty more on there you can sign up and then we also have if you're on there those members who are patreon members we always answer any questions that you have so you can write in we answer questions and we record it and we put it on on that site so so you guys can and girls and, and everyone else listening uh can can uh choose to uh, hop on there and check that stuff out. It gets, yep. you know, if you have questions, likely someone else has. So please check out that site. And as we grow, we can start doing more. So meaning if you have other ideas or stuff that we want to do just on that site, only we're more than happy to do webinars and presentation stuff. So please check out that site and and uh, also reach out to us anytime left of Greg at gmail.com. Please, we love getting feedback from folks as we want to know kind of how it comes across on, on your sure. end. And so we do appreciate everyone who has reached out on there and, and continues to. And, and, you know, if you do enjoy what we do, please share it with a friend, you know, shoot the podcast episode over, text it to someone, you know, and that's how we can grow this without having to get some sponsors and having a 10 minute intro of talking about products or something like that. <laughs> so, <Fair product>. can, <laughs> yeah. so, so uh, uh, any, any final, final words on this one, Greg, before we end? No, I, I can't wait for the new year. Uh, yeah. It's yet another chance for us to uh, go out and, and influence our environment. Yeah, and, hopefully and we, yeah, you know, we appreciate everyone's support throughout the year yeah. and hope to grow this even more next year and stay tuned. A lot of great training so, coming so, up. Yeah, so could, you can get involved and come to some of our training if you're interested. Always reach out and ask about it. But thanks so much for listening. And don't forget that training changes behavior.